Hi, I'm Brent Stafford and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. It's a hard thought to come to grips with the possibility that in the case of COVID-19, as in vaping, the Western Public Health Establishment is proving to be enormously incompetent or fantastically corrupt. There seems to be no other option to viably explain the repeated misuse of science, maligning of reason, and brazen propaganda tactics deployed in an effort to grow power and strip rights from the public. What's going on? Well, joining us today to help answer that question is Christopher Snowden, a celebrated author and libertarian champion for vaping as a tool for harm reduction. In his latest book, Killjoys, a critique of paternalism, he unpacks the paternalist policies pumped by the lifestyle regulators, a critique he now aims at the seemingly willful harm leveled by the Western public health establishment as a result of COVID-19. Chris, thanks for joining us again on RegWatch. Thanks, great to be back. Yeah, and thanks for your patience with all of our little technical problems here. We can thank YouTube. So first off, President Trump yesterday caused some major waves internationally by announcing a suspension of funding for the World Health Organization. Now, the WHO has been the bane of existence for vapors for many years, and tragically, it seems it may be at the center of a disastrous response to the coronavirus. What's your take on the president's actions and the WHO's track record in dealing with COVID-19? Well, I'm very happy. Quite honestly, I mean, I've spent years, as have a handful of other people, trying to get the world's attention onto the WHO. And it's very, very difficult. Most people just don't care. I mean, they don't have, strictly speaking, kind of political, you know, regulatory, legislative power. And um, they naturally have a halo over their heads because they did great work in the 20th century eradicating smallpox and so on. Um, they still do you know, a, a lot of good work now, let's be honest about it. Um, and people like me and you who you know, generally become aware of them quite regularly as a result of their propaganda against vaping and indeed what they do on smoking and alcohol and sugary drinks and all this other lifestyle stuff, um, we're kind of aware of um, what a dubious organization it is, you know, the lack of accountability, kicking journalists out of conferences, putting out anonymous briefings you never seem to know who's working there who's saying what who's pulling the strings uh combined with you know corruption scandals expenses scandals and stuff that occasionally makes it into the um the the press um so i'm i'm very happy that you know one of the a few silver linings from this whole you know crisis world crisis at the moment is that people decide to look a bit more carefully at the who and as you say Lo and behold, they've been incompetent and kind of shady and not very accountable. And, you know, my position for a long time has been that WHO needs serious reform. I wonder whether actually such reform is even possible. But if it isn't possible, the organization should simply be replaced. I say simply as if it's an easy thing to do. But, I mean, once you have a number of big donors getting behind an alternative organization that's going to focus entirely on infectious diseases and you're not dealing with the current leadership and management of the organization, then, no, you could do it. You could, you could replace it. You could push it to the margins. And the WHO can carry on bitching about vaping and sugary drinks while another organization goes back to what the WHO was when it was originally founded in the mid 20th century. So I want to dive in more on WHO and then of course get down into our regions and, and, and try to get an understanding of how maybe potentially even vaping kind of blazed some of the path to COVID when it comes to just at least creating a state of mind within the media and within all the governors in the US, it seems that the same governors that have instituted some of the most draconian uh, you know, lockdown uh, restrictions are also the same ones that were ready or did actually pull the trigger on vaping. But before we do that, for our audience who may not know who you are and what you do, um, fill them in on that. You know, I've called you, you know, a vape champion and you, you are, it's a libertarian position that you have. You're your, oh, one of the best books I've ever written, read was The Velvet Glove Iron Fist, which was the 400-year history kind of thing of, of tobacco control, which was your book. And it was like one of the first books I read when I you know came onto this file. Oh, well, well thank you. Um, yeah, that came out 
uh, 11 years ago now. So that's the history of anti-smoking. And I don't think vaping got a mention. It may have had a very brief mention, but it was in the very early days of vaping. Oh, there, thank you, yes. Available on Amazon and all good bookshops. Great book. Um, so, yeah, it was just on the cusp of vaping. It was just as I, I think, as it came out, I just tried my first e-cigarette, and then I became a full-time vapor, I think, in 2011, so eight years ago now. No, nine years ago now. Um, and, um, yeah, at the time I wrote the book, I was a smoker, and, yeah, you know, I always had, you know, classical liberal beliefs. I'm a liberal in the uncorrupted British sense of the word. Um, and what was happening to smokers at that time, smoking bans and, you know, very high taxes and the, the, the general harassment and kind of stigmatization of smokers, I found really disturbing. Um, and I could also see it being applied in other areas. I could see that it was going to be applied in exactly the same way, often by the same people to diet, with obesity used as the kind of um, uh, as the excuse there, really. Uh, there was definitely going to be applied to, to alcohol and possibly some other things. Now, as I say, the time vaping hadn't quite... Um, because it certainly hadn't become mainstream, and if I was to revise that book, as I hope to one day, it will include at least one chapter looking at the whole vaping thing. Um, but it's actually a pretty good, you know, example of what I'm talking about. That these people, um, are not all interested in health. Some of them are just puritans. Some of them just hate big business, and obviously the, the tobacco industry in particular. And you've seen that with vaping because as no real scientific reason to, to go after it. In fact, every scientific reason, uh, particularly if you're anti-smoking, to be in favor of it. So, um, yeah, we've seen what is clearly to me a, a moral crusade against vaping uh, that's been utilizing all the junk science it was building up in the kind of 10, 20 years before I wrote that book on on smoking. You know, the, the science around um, smoking, third-hand smoke and this kind of nonsense. So would you, th do you think that this is a, uh, you know, about money uh, for us here and with our viewers and well, my viewers are actually quite frustrated with me sometimes because I'm always shooing away the money talk because I, I believe that in the end, it's much more dragon slayer or much more ideologically bent. Uh, if you can control what people put in their body, you control the people, that kind of thing. And that it's not as much to do with money, though money always has something to do with it and it certainly helps but there's something kind of larger and ideological going on. Do you share some of those th thoughts or, you know, please have a go at that? I, I basically agree with you. I think most of the people on both sides of any argument actually are, are you know, sincere, uh, more or less at least, or certainly driven by what you might call ideology if you want, but um, you know, certain beliefs um, have certain goals. I, I think there's actually very few people outside of kind of the legal profession and maybe some lobbyists who are saying things they don't believe just for money. Um, and yeah, that's, that's true, I think, with, with vaping and in general with smoking. I have to say it, it is a bit different in the United States of America where there do seem to be some pretty blatant conflicts of interest in terms of the Master Settlement Agreement and the, the states, the individual states, I mean, having to... Uh, essentially, keep selling cigarettes to to keep them, you know, to keep their, their state governments going, um, and yeah, and you get a bit of stuff with with big pharma, which is kind of you know, it's there and it's interesting, and it does drive some of the opposition to vaping has done in in the EU. I'm sure it does in in, in America, um, but if you look at the main people who are crusading against vaping at the WHO. Um, in California, people like Stanton Glass, in, in, in Australia, I, there's no doubt in my mind these people are genuine fanatics. I don't know if that makes them any better than being um, you know, uh, paid lobbyists, but I, yeah, I tend to assume these people are just sincere, but sincerely wrong. So genuine fanatics, I think that's a good place to start because that's really where, if, if science is being corrupted, for instance, because of fanaticism, uh, does it stop with vaping? I mean, can we see the same kind? Those same, it seems to me that it's the same people, the same type of people, Some in some cases, the same people. It's certainly the same science, the science of epidemiology. We've had a lot of people on recently that we've been talking with, including some pretty you know big epidemiologists, and I've been putting the question to them, is uh, epidemiology broken? Is it not a broken science? Observational epidemiology has been broken for a very, very long time, particularly in politicized areas uh, of, of, of science. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's 
overwhelmingly junk, the stuff that comes out uh, in terms of ep observ uh, observational epidemiology in alcohol, vaping, smoking, food. I mean, nutritional epidemiology is just garbage, no matter how sincere you are in trying to actually get to the truth. This is you know, almost impossible to do anything with the data. Um, and, but a lot of the, the other stuff is yeah, confirmation bias, I think, probably the most charitable way. Uh, to look at it, you can really produce any findings you want. One of the interesting things about the, the, the COVID-19 thing is in Britain, and I'm sure this is true around the world, we start to see epidemiologists on TV who are actually e experts in epidemics. They are <laughs> genuine epidemiologists, and they're not working on um, you know, getting a, a, a small sample of people and seeing what happens a year later or looking through their medical records. They actually about epidemics and they're using models but the models are kind of transparent and they kind of make sense and the people behind them explain them in, in layman's terms uh, and you can take them or leave them but you know the, there's a the kind of a, there's an accountability and transparency there um but you know the kind of epidemiology that we've been reading about for years and years and years if not decades up until about six weeks ago was junk science basically yeah it's it's come up with the occasional useful or uh, true finding but very very rarely usually it's just utilized um selectively to promote a particular agenda and so would you say then that the models that were used to shut down western civilization the ones out of imperial college in london and of course washington state and the various other ones I mean, why were they trusted then so strongly? Well, I don't see any reason to distrust them as such. Um, I don't think anybody working in that field has a particular bias, really, one way or the other. You know, their only incentive is not to be proven disastrously wrong in a few months' time, which is a pretty big incentive. Um, so, yeah, all models are useless, but some are useful. That's you know the famous saying about statistical modeling. And I think the ones from Imperial, for example, are useful because they give you uh, really a quite a quite a straightforward and comprehensible uh, illustration of what the government's trying to do: squashing the sombrero, flattening the curve. A lot of people misunderstood it, and they talk about is this herd immunity, is this not herd immunity, all this kind of stuff. There's no point in going into that. Um, but the basic principle that we will allow this to spread because we don't want to totally destroy our economy and it will spread anyway because we haven't got a vaccine, but we're not going to allow it to spread so much that it devastates our health service and people are dying in the corridors. That seems a perfectly reasonable policy to me. And whether the model is precisely accurate or not is neither here nor there in a sense because you wouldn't expect it to be. The point is it's, it's illustrating. Um, what the policy is going to be and i think actually although the you know a lot of journalists are going for gotchas and trying to you know, make claims about the government's u-turn on this the government doesn't know what it's doing on this actually the government's been following the scientists scientists may be wrong i don't know but i mean the what they're saying seems perfectly plausible to me yeah i, I know that um you know for my concern uh, with following this is that the instant that uh talk of the lockdown happened it was unmistakable, the hysteria. Uh, the hysteria, you know, you can smell it. And, it. and it's not like it was real fear. Like, we live in this, like, pseudo-hysteria world where I've seen real hysteria, where, you know, people actually running <laughs> from, you know, from risk, from danger. But this, you know, it's so mixed up with virtue and, and a whole bunch of other stuff that it just doesn't didn't feel like, you know, a, a real hysteria. And it just felt like any one of the other kind of mass media generated hysterias that we've had, except for this one, lockdown, you know, Western civilization and is going to kill more people. I mean, is going to kill more people than coronaviruses. I, I don't know. I don't know if you have enough data at this time to, to see. You've got countries like Belarus and to a lesser extent, Sweden, um, kind of acting as control groups. Um, but if places like Nicaragua and Belarus end up with the same proportion of deaths as the UK and Italy or France in a year's time, I mean, it would kind of be a scientific anomaly. I mean, it would be really weird that that, that would happen because clearly the lockdown is going to 
break down the infection rate. It's going to massively, and it is apparently, you know, um, slowing down the infection rate. The UK seems to have hit its peak. Italy has certainly passed its peak and is coming down. Um, it's a very fast-moving area of research. You know, it feels like this has been going on for bloody years already. It's only really been kind of three weeks lockdown over here, and each day brings a new data point. But from what I can see, and I kind of you know, follow it fairly closely, just, you know, the raw data, it's a highly infectious disease. It's not particularly deadly if you're going to compare it to, you know, the bubonic plague or Ebola. Um but it has the potential, because it's so infectious, to create a huge number of deaths at any given time. And if you were, you know, pretty hardcore kind of Anne Ryan person, you might just say, well, the economic cost is too great. Just let people die in the streets, um, get it over and done with, and then whoever survives will have herd immunity. And it'll probably be 99% of the population. But I think from a political point, point of view, let alone a kind of humanitarian point of view, you just can't allow that to happen. I think we just have to keep our fingers crossed that the lockdown won't last too long. Once it does, we've got enough testing and tracing in place to stamp out outbreaks in different parts of the country once it returns. So we don't have to go into lockdown again, but it wouldn't surprise me if we do have to do that. But so, you're right about the cost. It's enormous. And of course, that, that cost will lead to, to people dying. And they, those lives lost will not be as visible as the ones that we're, we're kind of uh, notching up every day very publicly. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is not even just the lives, it's the kind of transformation of the relationship between government and its citizens when you're going to basically, you know, throw hundreds of millions of people onto welfare, uh, potentially, you know, ruin a lot of small businesses to mid-sized businesses. It's, it, it's not, it, I mean, I think you'd have to be pretty kind of unaware to see how that advances um, you know, a political cause that's not one based on freedom. Yeah, I mean, I mean up to a point, I agree with that. Um, I mean, the, the lockdown has to be pretty short and, you know, yeah. sharp. Sure. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Thank you. Most, yeah. most countries can just about afford to have a month, maybe two months in lockdown. Yeah, you're obviously right about the unemployment. You're right about the, the, the business going bust. But at this point in the pandemic, we can still keep our fingers crossed for a V-shaped recovery. Okay. Um, it is different to previous recessions. It's different to the financial crisis of 2008 in that there is not a lack of demand in the economy. People have got money they want to spend it. They just can't spend it because they've been told to stay at home and all the shops are closed. So we, ha we won't have this kind of downward spiral in which people don't have money to spend and therefore people lose their jobs and the people who lose their jobs don't have money to spend. You won't have that so long as the government gives people enough money to keep going for this relatively short period and we have a fairly short lockdown and afterwards people go out and they, they get that haircut they've been meaning to get, they buy that product that they've been meaning to, to buy. That might be a bit optimistic, I don't know, but at this stage, the cost of it doesn't have to be as great as the financial crisis. You just said the key word haircut. I'm getting really close. I'm I'm yeah. getting I'm getting mad, Chris. I got to tell you, the next time a politician uh, tells somebody that they're going to give them dignity, just ask them for a haircut. We're all going to have buzz cuts by the end of this. <laughs> oh yeah, well not me, not me, man. I'm 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 looking. But you know, it's interesting. It's on a side note on that because. You know, the in, in North America, you can maybe tell me, there, I do know in North America and certainly in Canada and certainly here in BC, if you are a licensed hairstylist, which you need to have a license, you're regulated to cut hair. Why? I don't know. I mean, I mean, come on. Why do you need a, a government license? But the government has threatened everybody who has a government license to cut hair that if they cut anybody's hair during uh, COVID, during the lockdown, they will lose their license. And if they're associated with a business, they've threatened the business too as well. So, I mean, that's pretty heavy handed. And, you know, it leaves me to wonder when we're talking about regulations, just like how many different, you know, uh, professions have been in, in services have been regulated to the point where they can be controlled like that in a, in a situation like this. I mean, cutting hair goes back in quite a few years. <laughs> sure, yeah, right. And without even a license. That's right. Um, you, 
I don't know if you've seen any of the pictures from the UK, but the police here have been throwing their weight around in some pretty absurd and surreal ways. Um, you know, look, I'm, I'm in a way I'm kind of laid back about this temporary loss of liberty because I do believe that politicians haven't introduced it because they they secretly want a totalitarian society. Um, in the UK, at least, it's all got a sunset clause, and I'm pretty sure Boris Johnson, of all people, wants to return to normality very quickly. But it has shown that you can't trust the police, or some some members of the police, let's be fair, um, who will enforce not just the, you know, they go beyond the letter of the law, let alone the spirit of the law, in hassling people who are just sat on a park bench or just sat with a friend uh, having a beer in the sunshine. Um, so, yeah, obviously, I'm a libertarian. I am not happy about this, but it's a really exceptional and horrific time. It's will probably be people will be talking about this forever. I mean, it'd be it'd be get it'll get really boring. You know, our grandchildren will be so bored of people talking about the you know the spring of 2020. Um, but I, I, the important thing for libertarians is to obviously you know bear in mind what liberties were, were temporarily losing and make sure that it is temporary push for them. And in fact, in some areas such as occupational licensing, say actually when push came to shove during the coronavirus crisis, was this stuff really necessary? I think there's there's quite a few things. If you look on the Twitter hashtag uh, never needed, there's a whole list, an ongoing collection of daft laws from around the country that were brought in usually to protect some industry or other or some business or other, um, and they're not needed, and they're stupid, and governments are relaxing them because it doesn't do any harm to relax them, and we need them relaxed at this point in time. So in that sense, there's a few things that um, may, there might be maybe a few lessons to, to learn from a libertarian perspective for politicians. What's the what's the scuttlebutt amongst all you libertarians with regards to this? Are you are you sharing some like minded, or there has to be some of you that are that got pitchforks out? Yeah, I mean, there's there's um there's a few people who say we should never go into lockdown at all, let nature take its course. There's not too many of those people, but they get a lot of attention because it's such an extreme position. I'm thinking of Peter Hitchens, who's by no means a libertarian and has never said anything libertarian about anything else, as far as I can tell. Um. And then there are people saying what you said before, which I think is an absolutely valid point, that there is a, clearly a trade-off here between the, the not only the economic damage and the damage to liberty, but the actual damage to health of having people locked up in the house for a prolonged period of time and want to see the lockdown end as quickly as possible. And I, I, I kind of lean that way myself. You know, I'd rather see the lockdown end sooner rather than later. On the other end of the scale, you've got people like Piers Morgan who were screaming for this to happen in the first place. And um, they don't seem to have any end in sight. You know, the government isn't pursuing a herd immunity um, program as such. But in a way, it kind of is, but it, it just can't say that. You know, if, it, if, it was, if it was pursuing purely a suppression strategy, if it was only interested in absolutely minimizing every uh, death, uh, no matter what age, we would have gone into lockdown a month earlier and we wouldn't come out of it for another two years or whenever it is that the vaccine comes. You know, I don't yeah. think anyone sensible actually thinks that we should lock down the entire economy until everybody has had a vaccine. We do accept on some level that there is a trade-off uh, and that ultimately, you know, if people can't go out to work, they, they are going to go hungry and starve at some point. The government can't keep bailing people out indefinitely. So we do actually implicitly accept that there is a trade-off between the economy and preventing deaths. So about that, um, there is, it, it, certainly in the last 20, 30 years, uh, but definitely since the 1990s, we, we've turned into you know, a risk adverse culture, a, a culture that's all about safety. And that tracks into some of the conversation we're gonna have here about vaping, but I wanna move through into the lifestyle regulation uh, issue. So, I mean, there is really this penchant right now that is just, we've got to save every, if it, like Governor Cuomo, Cuomo said, you know, I mean, if all we do here with COVID saves just one life, then it's worth it. Well, that's just total bullshit. I mean, it's not just saving one life. Oh, we'll just, you know, bankrupt the entire world for one life. That's just crazy. That's, that's progressive. That's utopian beyond belief. That is just not credible coming from, anybody and he's the governor of new york right so and when he does that he's appealing to this ingrained 
safety culture that's been hammered into people through public health uh, for many years now. Yeah, it's it's not a serious policy. It's a it's a cliche. It's a greeting card sentiment. You know, um, but nobody wants to hear it at this point in time. Toby Young, a journalist in the UK, wrote an article about it a little while ago and was you know accused of being a eugenicist and a Nazi. And his article did have quite a few flaws in it in terms of the statistics, but his basic point was perfectly reasonable, which was we don't consider life to be priceless. Nobody actually does. Governments, least of all. And then when government is rationing out health care or if it's trying to um, if it wants to build some road safety improvement, it will look at how many lives are going to be saved and it will put a price on those lives. And if the price comes, you know, above the cost of the project or above the cost of the medicine or the operation, then the government won't do it because we live in a world of scarce resources, the basic foundation of economics. So, no, we, we wouldn't keep the lockdown in place for two years if only, you know, 10 people hadn't had coronavirus yet, for example. Clearly not. So then the question is, well, at what point do you accept that there are, you know, there's a small enough risk that you want to, you want to open up? And you can make an economic calculation about that. I mean, you haven't got very good data, but in, in theory, you can say the lockdown's going to cost this much, and it's going to save this number of lives. And in the UK, we tend to value a life at thirty thousand pounds, sixty thousand pounds, depends how you do it. They're both arbitrary figures. But you can do it. You can make that calculation. It's not clear to me yet that the lockdown is worth it in those terms, but it's certainly not obscene to have that conversation. It's perfectly reasonable to have that conversation. The Department of Health in Britain makes these calculations all the time. Nobody complains, probably because nobody really understands it or knows about it, but it's you have to do it. So let me ask you this. Um, let's skate into vaping here a little bit and let's do a with a little bit of a backtrack. So 18 months ago or so, when FDA, then FDA uh, Commissioner Scott Gottlieb got up on the you know lecture lectern there and said that there was an epidemic of teen vaping that posed a clear and present danger, he's using the language of disease and epidemic and outbreak to describe a behavior amongst teens when there was no data yet. The data was not publicly available. It's only, it's only, he's only, he's only seen it for about a month and a half. It was only gathered about five months before that, if that. Um, so it was really, it was, it's not hard data. And they're pulling the trigger on this using disease language, the language of disease. And then, of course, that rolled in it, one year later, you have uh, the vaping related lung illness and with the CDC. And I think that's been proven to have been a deception that, I mean, something obviously now, it's funny, with your article that you just wrote with regard to the WHO and other fantastically corrupt, uh, what was the other side of that? That was... Uh, incredibly inept. And, and incredibly inept, right. So I've been saying about the CDC when it came to the vaping-related lung illness is either they're totally incompetent or it's treachery. And either one, I mean, either one is just a disaster for to have the, the world's preeminent... Uh, disease uh, control organization, you know, being either incompetent or acting treacherously. So here we are. Um, they had the entire world. They did. It was a worldwide story, the vaping related lung illness. It impacted many countries. And of course, in the US and Canada, it led to daily coverage by mainstream media and local media uh, with, you know, dramatic new cases of vaping related lung illness, you know, each day new deaths. I mean, that just rolled right into COVID. So what do you make of what happened with vaping there and what and did it blaze a path into COVID in some manner? Uh, well, a few questions there. I mean, for one thing, in the same way that we've started to remember that epidemiologists are supposed to be studiers of epidemics, we're remembering what a real epidemic is. It's a term that, as you say, has been misused a lot by the modern so-called public health movement because it makes something sound like it's a matter for government action when it isn't. So childhood obesity, for example, is not an epidemic. Uh, drinking is not an epidemic. Um, these things, if anything, are, are endemic, but they're certainly not contagious. And that's one of the key criteria for an epidemic. What we're living under now is an epidemic and no one 
uh, seriously disputes that. I think actually, to, you know, I'd like to take a, a positive view about some of this stuff. I think it's going to be quite hard for a lot of the public health people after this to s still keep using this kind of language One, once people have lived through what we're living through and have got the scars to show it. Um, you, you'll notice perhaps that uh, they've been very quiet on things like soda taxes recently because the public would just laugh at them, frankly. You know, the, the, the WHO came up with something yesterday about, oh, we're very concerned that people are on lockdown and we're allowing them to to have alcohol in the house as a you know carcinogenic substance and so on. Um, and they just got ridiculed for it. Um, so some of this language they co-opted from the genuine public health movement, from genuine public health problems. Um, some of this language, I don't know if they can carry on using it, but the reason they use it is because it is from the days when there were, were real public health issues, which is to say issues that can only be dealt with by the collective and that individuals cannot escape from, but through their own actions. So if you've got a contaminated water supply, that's not something you can really avoid if you're living in the middle of the city. The government has to sort that out. If you've got a, a factory bunching out smoke, the same thing. If you've got somebody wandering around with a highly infectious disease, yeah, sometimes the government needs to act. Sometimes the government needs to act coercively. And libertarians have got no problem with that. I wrote an article, I think, back in February, saying libertarians would not necessarily be against a lockdown. We're not against coercion if it's protecting people from other people, which is to say from other disease carriers. Bless them. So quarantine is very illiberal, but there's nothing wrong with it. It fits in fine with what John Stuart Mill wrote about in the 19th century, which is why I you know, base many of my beliefs on. Um, so, yeah, the e-cigarette thing, we can see now, I think, that that wasn't an epidemic. You know, it, it, it wasn't an infectious disease. There were clusters around the country, but the clusters were really where the, um, where the black market THC cartridges were being sold. Um, it looks very rinky-dink now, like a lot of public health so-called epidemics do, like childhood obesity, I think, does. You know, we've now realized what a genuine public health problem is. It's pretty bad, and it does require big government, unfortunately, for a, uh, for a, a short period of time. Um, but it's just in a totally different league to all right. the stuff we've been told were epidemics in, in the very recent past. So let's dive into some of the stuff that, that definitely has happened in terms of connecting the two, and that has been almost immediately... There was, you know, all of the usual players, you know, Stanton Glantz came out with a blog post on, I believe, March 6th, March, March 3rd or 6th, coming out there really hitting, vaping hard, um, you know, and, and I've got some of your stuff here uh, um, uh, curated. And so, and then we had, you know, vaping, you know, could increase heart risks uh, tied to COVID-19. You know, coronavirus has closed vape shops and left cigarettes readily available. I mean, it's definitely been a part of the news, and it seemed to be very opportunist, uh, opportunistic for some of the people in public health to come out and, and try to make this connection. What do we know about the connection between vaping? Does it make it worse, uh, COVID worse, or does it help? Because that's also a part of the thing here. I, I don't think there's any evidence either way. I've not seen a single study that tells you how many people in coronavirus wards are vapors. There's quite a few now, growing number showing how many are smokers. And in most of them, there are fewer smokers than you would expect. Um, probably the most solid evidence came out in New York uh, the weekend, I think. A uh, study of four or 5,000 uh, COVID patients. And it seemed to show that there were significantly fewer smokers in there now this is a very interesting scientific question and uh, obviously the, the traditional public health movement are not going to go anywhere near it in fact they basically lied the whole way through public health england said that smokers are 14 times more likely to become critically ill with coronavirus than non-smokers based on one study from china which involved five smokers right three became critically <laughs> ill you know that's a four, you know, 14 times you know we would see this Doctors and nurses would have been aware of this from day one in Wuhan if there was anything like that effect. And there isn't. If anything, the current evidence seems to suggest the opposite. I'm not going to 
you know, draw any firm conclusions from that. We'll see what happens. But certainly, smoking doesn't seem to be a factor in increasing risk. I think we can probably safely say that. And there's just no evidence at all of vaping. And these people are being, as you say, unbelievably opportunistic. But what do you expect? They've got nothing else to do at the moment. These are people who've been masquerading as public health professionals who couldn't tell you one end of the microscope from another. They don't know anything about virology, microbes, infectious disease. They are a bunch of sociologists, mechanical engineers, psychologists, and various other social scientists who come out of the university with a bee in their bonnet about vaping or smoking or drinking or obesity and have found that the you know quack science of modern public health allows them to call themselves a professor after 10 years. What are they doing at the moment? There are thousands of these people. Well, they're doing what you would expect. They're trying to crowbar their own little obsession into the coronavirus conversation. And so you have people saying, oh, you, we shouldn't, like the WHO, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be having people drinking. If anything, we should try and ban drinking because it's, you know, it, it, it weakens your immune system and makes you more vulnerable to coronavirus. Well, maybe it does, but there's actually no evidence for that. I, again, I haven't seen any evidence at all on alcohol. It's just speculation. Vaping, totally speculation. Smoking, a lie. I think we can say that the smokers are more at risk of COVID complications. The only lifestyle factor that is a genuine um, risk factor is morbid obesity. Possibly obesity in general, but certainly morbid obesity um, seems to be really quite heavily implicated um, in, in terms of whether somebody is not, not going to catch it, but is going to progress to the intensive care wards. Um, and we know that underlying health conditions are, are a big factor in that. That's a very broad category, underlying health conditions. And it doesn't necessarily follow that somebody who's a heavy drinker or even a smoker is going to have that kind of underlying health conditions that put them at greater risk. But the only one of these lifestyle factors that people have been banging on about for the last 30 years in so-called, you know, scare quotes, public health is morbid obesity. Right. And then certainly, obviously, that has definitely been proven to be the biggest factor um, out of all of the patient studies that I've seen. Uh, Chris, being a man is pretty bad news as well. Sorry, what was that? Being a man is also quite Yeah, being a guy, yeah, that strikes me as, you know, terrible. <laughs> so, male privilege. Yeah, male privilege, exactly. We, we die earlier. Yeah, disease takes us more. And then for those of us who are married, we die earlier too. But anyhow, I don't really want to go there it's only too. because we want to. That's right, right, only because we want to. I'm, we're going to take a, a moment. I'm, I'm going to do um, our little bit of a fundraising break here in the show a little bit earlier than normal because we've got something uh, really cool that's happening um, a, a great uh, guy by the name of Dino uh, Bacard Bacardi, I think. I keep thinking of the drink, and I don't want to say it wrong, but I, I believe that is actually it. He's uh, a founder and shop owner of White Horse Vapor in North Providence, Rhode Island. And he reached out to us a couple of uh, weeks ago and said, hey, want to do something that is really different and will stand out to help raise some funds for RegWatch um, to uh, obviously, you know, keep our coverage going on the vaping side. And Dino and his people at Whitehorse Vapor uh, came up with a very, very cool plan. So they sent us a video, which I just got today. I just want to make sure here that potentially that I can cut to this without a problem. So let, let's go. Hey, Brett. Whitehorse Vapor here. Joey's behind the camera. How's it going? It's Joey from Marketing. Thank you so much you do for our industry here in North Providence. We recently had to transition to a drive through scenario due to COVID, obviously. So we got these pylons up, donate every transaction. We're asking our customers, donate $1 to regular watch and Brett Stafford to you. Uh, you are a very reputable source and everything you do for our industry is amazing. And we can't thank you enough. Um, here we have a banner, every single transaction. Christina. Hi, here's Christina, and we're supporting Regulator Watch, and we're every asking every transaction to donate a dollar or more. Nice. And here we are. You are always playing in our store, Pat. We got you on the loudspeaker, so we always know. You can come on over, Dara. Come on over, Dara. 
Vape store owners, now more than ever, we need to support Brett and Regulator Watch. It's crucial. There's so much bad information about our industry, about the product we sell, about the people that we have saved. There's too much bad information. We need Regulator Watch and other industry advocates like him. We need to support them as much as possible right now. It's a do or die scenario more than ever. Online. Even online, we can do this. I'm Dara. I take care of all the online orders at White Horse, and we're asking customers to donate at every transaction. There you go. Let's band together and do this. Can't wait. Thanks so much, Brett. You're the best. You're amazing. Thank you. And thanks to Dino, too, and everybody there at White Horse Vapors. Fantastic. Though it's a bit scary seeing my face big, big like that on the side of the wall, but I'm sure somebody will be taking pot shots at it you know, soon. Dino, thank you so much. Everybody, you can uh, go online. You can do that. It's White Horse Vapor. You saw the URL. And we'll get Dino on the show sometime next week uh, to fill us in on how things are going and to get some of his thoughts about what's been happening in the vaping world in the U.S. and obviously what hope there might be uh, down the road. So thank you, Dino, and thanks, everybody else. So, Chris, back to the bad stuff here. Vaping, is is it going to find a renaissance after this, or do you think that it's not good news? I don't think it should really have that much effect. I don't know. I can't speak for North America. Um, obviously, I'm lucky for once in Britain that we have a, um, a public health community that is pretty supportive of vaping and to be honest, over the years, I've had to just kind of cut out reading about a lot of the stuff in America because it just seems so insane what 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 people are allowed to say over there. Yeah, you know, how much people like Stan Lance can get away with without being called up, called called out on you know obvious fabrications. I know he's had something retracted now, but you know there's a, there's hundreds of studies to go. Um, so I find it very depressing what's happened in America, and I, I don't know what anyone can do about it. The rest of the world, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not sure that the idea that vaping is linked to coronavirus has spread particularly uh, widely. I, I don't know if it is filtered through to the man on the street. Um, and as I said, there's, there's really no evidence for it. I'd be amazed if any evidence does emerge. Perhaps Stanton Glantz will produce some kind of study over in California making some claim or other. But I don't really see it cutting much ice. People really have got bigger fish to fry at the moment. Uh, people genuinely are looking for solutions here. And I dare say in, in the States and in some of the other countries that have really suffered from the you know, hysteria of the so-called epidemic last year, there are people waiting to exploit that. Um, but I'm, I'm relatively optimistic it won't have any real uh, long-term impact. But, I mean, the, the, the long-term trend anyway was bad, right? So even if it doesn't have any impact, things seem to be going downhill. And, again, the WHO is you know, very largely responsible for that. You know, my hope is, you know, the re one of the reasons I was so happy when I saw Trump do what he did uh, yesterday was, you know, it's the first time the WHO has ever really been challenged. Um, it's massively needed reform. Anyone who follows this who's involved in, in the vaping kind of scene um, has seen how utterly corrupt it is scientifically and morally, um, has seen the damage it's done by encouraging mainly developing countries to ban or very excessively regulate vaping gear um, because it has much more sway in developing countries. And... Um, you know, I, I just hope that the fact that Trump has said, okay, no more, we're going to at least wait until there's a review into how you guys have dealt with China over coronavirus before we give you any more money. I think it, it's a good thing. And I know there's a lot of people understandably saying, well, this is not the right time to do it. We're in the middle of a pandemic. The WHO needs money. But quite honestly, if you don't do it now, it will never happen. Once the pandemic is over, people will go back to not paying any attention to the WHO, apart from nerds like you and me. And it will continue. In fact, it will worsen over time. And it will handle the next pandemic even worse. It will continue to harass vapors and various other you know, 
deviance in society as it has been doing, it must be you know, seriously reformed, if not destroyed and replaced. And so I'm, I'm well aware that Trump did not do this because he's interested in cleaning up the behavior of international agencies. I, I realize he's trying to distract his attention from his own very poor handling of COVID-19, particularly in, in January and February. But he actually did get one thing right in February or January, I think, um, which was a travel ban. He stopped people flying in from China and Europe. And that was a sensible move to make. And WHO condemned him for it or condemned the policy in general. Fortunately, most countries ignore the WHO on that ridiculous piece of advice. Right. Um, you know what? So the one one thing he got right, he was condemned for by the WHO. Right. So yeah, he's not doing this for vapors. Obviously, he's not even doing this because he cares about high standards in public life. He's doing it for fairly cynical political reasons and because he's a bit angry. But it's still a good thing. You can still have good things happen for the wrong reasons. And if the WHO has some pressure put on it, has the spotlight shone upon it. For a little while, and people say there's something wrong with this institution. We just assumed they were a bunch of good guys, but actually they are, like you say, inept or corrupt. That that's a good thing because we can get a conversation started about all the other stuff it's been doing for years and years. And I do think that there was a moment this fall where he took a look around and realized that his public health agencies were leading down the garden path when it came to vaping. Like they didn't tell them. They did not tell the president that there was two sides to the vaping story and they only gave him the one side. And there he was, you know, banning vaping. And then all of a sudden he gets this huge pushback. And I think he I think most normal people um, are way predisposed to trust public health to don't even bother, you know, giving me a story about why, why public health might be lying or, or, you know, might be treacherous or anything, right? You have to trust public health. And I would imagine that the president had that same thought um, right up until the moment he realized they're leading him down the garden path on vaping, they're being political on vaping. And then, and that's when, you know, he shook his head and, and took some action or at least non-action, so to speak, not by not banning it. So I think that might have played some role. You know, I, you want your presidents and your your leaders to have a certain amount of healthy skepticism when it comes to the advice from all of the people in, in his administration that's giving advice. And, and that includes public health. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, in a way, that's one of the good things about having a guy who's really got no morals leading the country is that they're not, they're not going to become kind of ideologically committed to this pet cause seems to me from what I've read that it's his wife who got him onto this in the first place. So maybe they had some crosswords later on as well. I don't know. But once he, he's a pro business guy. Once he saw all the vape shops saying that we're going to go out of business here. Once he saw all the, we vape, we vote people, um, many of whom are his natural kind of voters, uh, protesting about this. He thought, why, why are we doing this again? What's, you know, what's the purpose of this? And good on him for doing a U-turn. A lot of politicians wouldn't have done it because by then they'd be so brainwashed by the public health people, they'd think that they were going to save tens of thousands um, of lives. So I mean, that was that was kind of a good thing, I guess. And uh, a lot of presidents uh, wouldn't have done it. Mm. So when it comes to public health, you've got, you know, what had been traditionally what most people had been uh, interacting with, which was the lifestyle regulators, the nannies, the the food, the soda, the smoking, the alcohol, the vaping, the sex, maybe potentially, and you know all those different areas uh, that they just you know in your nose and in your face and in your life on. And meanwhile, it's really the disease part that is the true uh, public health job. That's what it used to. That's what started it was fighting disease, tracking disease. And everything else. So, what would you like to see happen with regards to those two separate um, kind of uh, movements within public health? Uh, is there room for both moving forward, or do we need drastic changes in the way in which we, as the citizens, look at how we like we pay for public health? They should have taken care of us a little bit better um, in this situation. You know, what do we do with public health moving forward? Well, the key distinction is between public health and pretend public health. P 
public health, I write about this in Killjoys at some length, but yeah, it's very important to get this distinction between infectious diseases and collective problems that can only be dealt with by the collective and, you know, personal choices. Maybe I'm drinking too much under lockdown. That is not a public health problem. It may at some point become a problem for me, but that is a private problem. What, what I'm drinking, what I'm vaping is none of the government's business because it's none of anybody else's business. It doesn't affect anybody else in any kind of direct way. Um, that's obviously totally different to, to COVID-19. I'm not complaining about being stuck in my house for a few weeks, despite that being a much greater uh, restriction on my liberty than any of this nanny state stuff, because I want to protect myself. I want to protect other people. And the only way at this point in time we can do that is by social distancing. So we've got a real public health problem. I hope that people now see the distinction. And when some fanatic comes up in a few months' time talking about how binge drinking or child obesity or sugary drinks are public health epidemics, crises, problems, what have you, that they realize that they're really not. And that's the fundamental difference. To, to your question, can these people do both? Well, yeah, they've been doing both for a long time. Public Health England and World Health Organization, they've been doing both. Have they been doing both of them effectively? I would argue certainly not. They Their measures in the nanny state field haven't really led to any improvements of health. Um, you could argue maybe the anti-smoking movement is, has had an effect on, on smoking rates. I'm not so sure. They seem to be pretty much in decline anyway. Um, but maybe, yeah, maybe I dare say that you know, really hassling smokers, making them second-class citizens and making cigarettes unaffordable has had some effect on the smoking rate. But at what cost? The rest of it, has any country seen a fall in obesity? Despite whatever policies and taxes and bans have been brought in? No, none of it's, none of it's worked. Alcohol consumption seems to be completely independent of, of policy. Same with gambling, which the public health people have decided, weirdly, is a public health issue as well. Um, so they've been ineffective on that. But what's really pressing right now is whether their you know, distraction, whether their obsession with this other stuff has had a knock-on effect with the way they deal with contagious diseases. And I would certainly argue that it has, both for organizations like Public Health England and at the WHO. How could it not? I mean, aren't, aren't you always better specializing in one thing than trying to do 50 other things, getting involved in politics and inequality and housing and stuff like this, which public health people now think is part of their job? No, they should stick to infectious diseases. And infectious diseases is a complex problem in itself, and it's very far from being solved. You get coronavirus, Forget about coronavirus. Let's look at you know, diphtheria and malaria and hepatitis and, you know, diseases that still kill millions of people every single year in a, you know, in a lot, very large number of countries around the world. We have got nowhere near eradicating these things. And yet we're hassling people about drinking a can of Coke or vaping mango flavored e-cigarettes. It's obscene. You know, I think more or less the last line of, of, of my book, Killjoys, said that, you know, so long as there's a single person dying from infectious disease in the world, it's morally reprehensible to be wasting billions of pounds hassling middle-aged people about their, you know, wine consumption. Um, so, yeah, there is a massive distinction. I've been trying to make this case for so long. Massive distinction between public health issues and nanny state issues. Public health issues can be justified to any, you know, good libertarian. Perfectly good liberal grounds for justifying coercion for public health reasons in, in, in certain circumstances, but never in terms of lifestyle behavior, Puritanism and the nanny state. Yeah, I mean, I do agree. The thing, the thing with public health is that they're consumed by some of the same kind of what I do call treacherous ideologies. I mean, if you go to many of the sites, you'll find tons on diversity, inclusivity, gender, uh, you know, CDC has their healthy people 2020 plan. So they have a, a massive plan, which I'll take our viewers through in another show. It's a massive plan for 2020. And every single aspect of your life is being touched by the CDC and public health. I mean, right down to your social relationships. This has nothing to do with COVID. This is long before COVID. 
And when you're taking a look at it, you're going, well, where's the disease aspect in here? They're talking about outcomes of like getting four-year-olds better, you know, access to um, uh, school, but you know, it's particular specific curriculum and stuff like that. Well, what is, you know, the Centers for Disease Control doing with, you know, getting involved with that kind of stuff? It's, it's fundamentally a political movement. And it's fundamentally, let's be honest, a left-wing political movement, as most movement, you know, political movements that want to see a, a much bigger state tend to be. Um, once you start describing any health issue as being a public health issue, then you can make almost anything a public health issue. You can make something like housing or employment a public health issue. You make gambling a public health issue, right? So I mentioned gambling before. Gambling is an interesting one because I think it really exposes... The, the modern public health movement is just a carbon copy of the old Victorian moral middle class reform movement. Gambling has got nothing really to do with public health whatsoever. Obesity and alcohol and smoking, yeah, sure, they, they clearly have direct health impacts. Gambling is just something the moral Puritans have always disliked. So it's been crowbarred in there and public health people would say, yeah, well, if someone loses a lot of money at gambling, then they won't have any money to, to feed themselves and they might become malnourished and they might get stressed and they might start smoking. Yeah, this is so indirect as to be ridiculous. And you can say that about almost anything. Almost anything can make you stressed and take up smoking or you could spend your money on all sorts of different obsessions and, and not be able to feed your family. It doesn't make these things public health issues, except it does to these guys. And that's why you end up with public health professionals who think that their remit is almost every political question that's ever been considered. And they call it a public health issue and they say, well, I'm a public health professional. I did a two year conversion course and now you know, I've got a, a master's in public health and, I, and I've got the answer. And the answer is bigger government and more taxes. Um, the reality is that. Public health, even in the traditional sense, is a big enough discipline to take a lifetime to master. The idea that you suddenly become an, an expert on crime and unemployment and homelessness and you know, fiscal policy, because these things might have some effect on health somewhere down the line, therefore they're public health issues, is absurd. But these people, as a result of this delusion, have a highly inflated sense of their, their own opinion and think that they can muscle in on, on anything. Read The Lancet if you don't believe me. They have a thing called planetary health now. It goes beyond public health. This is essentially environmentalism. So, you know, a few doctors think that they're experts on, on how to get to net zero. You know, it's, it's, it's nothing. They're, they're no better than your average barroom bore. They're just talking about things that interest them, essentially. But because they're public health professionals, somehow that makes them an expert. Yeah, and I think the problem is, is that they can, they wield a lot of power and, and what they've got, public health has, that no other agency or movement has is a 100% direct access to the mainstream media that is completely compliant with every message that public health wants to wants to uh, get out there. I mean, yeah. it... And, and, and that, that's, the, that's one of the dangers once this is all faded away. I've already given you my kind of optimistic view, which is that maybe these guys have overused words like epidemic and, and indeed public health over the years. And now we've got a real public health epidemic. People will be a bit more cynical about it in the future. The flip side to that, which is perfectly feasible, is that people will be very grateful to epidemiologists for kind of navigating away through this. Uh, crisis we'll be very grateful for public health agencies for you know helping us out and therefore there'll be a clamor for more money for public health more money for the who and that money will be siphoned towards the usual lifestyle nonsense it won't go towards preparing for another pandemic yeah and there's also the the issue too as well and it's it's pretty clear that certainly with the economic changes in relation relationship kind of moves that happen here by throwing a whole bunch of people on welfare in the tens of millions, right? That they're making an argument uh, that, you know, climate change is an existential threat. You can believe it or not. But the fact is, though, is that it does seem to be that there are many activists that are looking to use this as a way to kind of pave the path for uh, more controls on fossil fuels. Yeah, I, I think they're going to get a pretty tough time getting a hearing, actually. I think Greta Thunberg has probably, you know, hit her high watermark. 
Mm. It, what you tend to see, without commenting on the climate change issue per se, what you tend to see is that in good times, people get very concerned about climate change, and when times are hard, they just kind of forget about it. That's what you saw leading up to the financial crisis in 2008. Newspapers were full of stuff about climate change. Then the economic crisis happened, and the environmentalists found it very difficult to, to get back into conversation for quite a few years, until really only the last two or three years. And I think um, the coronavirus, not only because of the health consequences of it, and the lockdown and all this kind of stuff, but also because of the, the fairly long-lasting economic consequences and the need for renewed austerity, um, I, I think they will probably struggle. But they, they've got a hard job, you know, in a way, because they're trying to convince us that, you know, 20, 30, 40 years hence, we're going to have a coronavirus, you know, multiplied kind of problem. And maybe they're right, I don't know. But it's so far off, and people just naturally look at their immediate circumstances so my prediction for what it's worth my predictions are usually pretty awful um, <laughs> I, I i think that the, the you know the extinction rebellion kind of people are going to struggle a bit certainly during this and definitely after uh, and probably after it as well yeah and i mean obviously i think that at some point i hope people can connect the fact that the kind of modeling uh i mean while it's epidemiology it's still population level it's still you know tons of factors and variables that are so hard to get your to get a handle on. And then that same kind of modeling is happening with climate change. I think my only thing with climate change, really, honestly, is that the, the level of hysteria and in, in the religious aspect to it that comes from people who are supposedly secular is really where, you know, my radar goes up. That and just the sheer belief in the science and just science. You don't believe in science? You got to believe in science. Believe in science, right? And it's just That's like, well. I kind of like Extinction Rebellion because they're so overtly medieval. <laughs> they they kind of they walk around dressed in the big green, uh, uh, big red robes and stuff. I mean, it looks just like something out of, um, out of the Middle Ages. Yeah, they're pre modern. Uh, they're pre modern. Yeah, similar kind of, end, uh, you know, the, the end is nigh mentality. So the fact that they're so kind of upfront about it, and it's so obviously, let's be honest, a cult. I mean, yeah. I read something a few weeks ago about how one of their, um, one, one of the you know, stunts that they considered was literally having somebody kill themselves in wow. public. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if someone goes through with it. You know, I've seen stuff about Extinction Rebellion, man. It's, you know, they, they're probably, there's some probably brainwashed people in that. Little movement. Yeah. So if you're going to be if you're going to be brainwashed, then like you said, you know, be properly brainwashed. That's that's kind of the right way to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Is that well, what I was saying? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. Um, so I mean, I think we're wrapping up here. I, uh, I we had a great conversation, and thanks for putting up with uh, the technical issues that we had with getting the stream out. And it looks like everything's gone fine. People are talking and and, and typing away. Tapity tap tap tap. So, you know, what do you want to leave our audience with? Because, you know, we do have a lot of vapors that watch and uh, they follow you and they, you know, try to gain some optimism from you, if I could say that, um, and watch for, you know, what you're saying with regards to anything to be concerned about. Well, if they follow me for optimism, I don't know why they do that. But if they do, <laughs> um, I'll try and I'll try and leave an optimist. Now, I, I genuinely think it's kind of a flip of a coin which way this goes. Uh Insofar as you know, thinking about what the long-term implications will be from the current pandemic for the public health movement in general and for vaping in particular, I think the optimistic take is that people have seen what a genuine public health epidemic is like. People have seen that the WHO is not this sainted organization run by angels, it's actually run by very fallible human beings serious uh, suspicions of incompetence and corruption. And so when the WHO comes up, as it surely will, after this is finished, uh, not this not this interview, after the, the pandemic is finished, mm -hmm. um, and starts banging on about the vaping epidemic um, or any other you know, lifestyle-related epidemic, it will uh, get a, a less of an easy ride than perhaps it sometimes does and the same is also true i think of some of the public health organizations particularly if they overstretch themselves over the course of the next few weeks and make themselves look ridiculous and some of them have already done that you know um if you take the um 
the example of Philip Morris, one of, one of Philip Morris's subsidiaries in Greece donated 40 ventilators to the Greek government and anti-smoking groups complained about it. And from what I could tell, and I'm obviously not allowed to leave the house, so I'm basing this on Twitter and below the line comments like most people are these days. Mm-hmm. This did not go down well with the general public who quite rightly thought that, hang on, you'd rather people die than accept a donation from a tobacco company. Same thing with the attempts by BAT and Philip Morris to look for a vaccine. There's some very interesting stuff about how tobacco uh, can potentially, the plant tobacco can potentially hold the key to a vaccine. It's already been done with Ebola, I understand. Yes. Um, and yet the WHO has come out saying, don't go anywhere in the tobacco industry. You don't breach the framework convention on tobacco control. And again, normal people find this insane. That is totally insane. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So hopefully they'll come up with this vaccine and the people at WHO will not take it. Yeah. Um, I guess they rely on herd immunity. Um, this kind of stuff, you know, and, and the, the more extreme claims about vaping, which will, will no doubt come, you know, um, there are a lot of, you know, sensible scientists who are not particularly sympathetic to vaping or smoking or to big tobacco or anything like this, who just want to find a solution or at least something that's going to mitigate this, this problem. And they're open-minded about it. And they'll see the fanatics for what they are, you know, if they carry on. Uh, kicking and screaming about every little thing, um, you know, like the examples I've, I've just given there. So there's every chance that the public health lobby, as we've known it, which is to say the nanny state lifestyle pretend public health lobby, will do a lot to discredit itself over the course of the next couple of months. And in a way, we should hope that that's what they do. We should certainly hope and probably expect that because organizations like the WHO have had a bit of sunlight shone on them for once, and normal people uh, looking at them and seeing how they behave, that they will lose some credibility. And that's a good thing because they do not deserve, obviously, to have the kind of credibility that they have with the public and with the government. Well, I totally agree. And thanks for that, Chris. And just hang tight there for one second. And that is, and that is it for this edition of RegWatch. Before you head off, please go to support.regulatorwatch.com. That's support.regulatorwatch.com and consider making a financial contribution to our vaping coverage. You can also check out White Horse Vapors, Vapor, White Horse Vapor in North Providence, Rhode Island. And that is Dino Bakari and his group there. And they are fantastic. And we've got a fundraiser on Facebook that you may have seen and you can help us out that way. And it's pretty easy. All you got to do is just find some money and toss it our way. You'll be happy you did that. And so will we. And while online, don't forget to like us on Facebook and to please follow us on Twitter. For RegulatorWatch.com, I'm Brent Stafford.